I'm testing it out of the box. For out, out of the box thermals! So, this is an Intel CPU versus an AMD CPU. And uh, the AMD CPU is measuring at, at a 21.6, which is a delta T over ambient of about zero. And the Intel CPU is measuring at 21.6, before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB Closed Loop Liquid Cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus 3120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake Rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 Gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. So as you can see, uh, when we get rid of the heatsink, that user last week was actually correct. Heatsinks are irrelevant. When you get rid of the heatsink and you just measure them out of the box, like a user would use them just like this, they are actually completely identical in performance. And I think if we were to take a CPU cooler, let's just let that kind of sink the heat for a second. Okay, that should be enough. Yep, still 21.6, so they're completely irrelevant. Uh, I apologize for last week, I said something about how CPU coolers were actually very important to measuring temperature for CPUs and how you can't just disregard them. But obviously this test proves if it's 21.6 now, delta T over ambient of zero C, and I take the cooler off, still 21.6. Well, I guess there's no reason for the cooler industry to exist anymore. So sorry, sorry Noctua, I didn't mean to put you out of business. Uh, so that was our out of the box thermals test that was requested by popular demand last week. You've now gotten it. You're welcome. Uh, welcome back to Ask GN. This is episode 61, I think. We are going to be taking questions from the comment section and from our Patreon Discord. You can leave questions in the comments below, and I will dig through all of your dank memes as well as actual questions. It gets harder every week to find the latter. And you can also post questions in our Patreon Discord if you go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. So let's start with a question on streaming and gaming, or just streaming in general. This one was posted by Otterwise in the Patreon Discord, and Otterwise asks, you guys have a lot of content on gaming and streaming, but what kind of hardware would be ideal for a dedicated streaming machine? This is a really good question. So most of our, actually all of our benchmarks at this point, have been just on a host system that games and streams to YouTube or Twitch simultaneously or records. And clearly for those types of workloads, really it's just more cores is more better for the host system because as you burden it with gaming and streaming tasks, if you're encoding and doing encoding tasks on the CPU, it's just gonna get weighed down with something like a four core, for example. So, we know what to expect for the host system. If you're doing a standalone streaming PC, in some instances it might come out to be potentially a little bit cheaper. The memory prices right now really screw everything up, but uh, basically what I would do is just some R5 CPU that can handle the encode no problem at all. You could buy the cheapest six core R5 you could spend five minutes overclocking it to three point something gigahertz, maybe 3.8 or nine. Uh, I think the 1600 would work well for that. And then really you could, if you, if you don't go too hard with the overclock, you could just use the stock cooler to keep costs down further or throw some $25 cooler on there like the Thermaltake Contact 12 or the, I don't really like the Hyper 212. Uh, the Th Thermaltake Contact 12 would be a better choice than the Hyper 212 for that one. But you throw something like that together, that's a really cheap system. Get the cheapest memory you can get that's within reason and uh, throw a light overclock on that as well. A couple hundred megahertz or something, slightly increase the multiplier. And you'd be good to go. Then you just need a capture card. So a capture machine like that, it doesn't need to be that powerful. And you can either take uh, parts you have lying around or just buy cheap R5, cheap board, cheap memory, and let it do its work. Uh, the only thing to be careful of is if you go with B350, get some kind of cooling on the VRMs if you do overclock it. But otherwise, that's what I would do. And if you do that route for gaming and streaming, in theory, the secondary capture machine should resolve the uh, lower 
frame time performance where you get spikes in frame time consistency during streaming from the host system, that should be fixed by having an external machine. Uh, and also, depending on what you're doing, it might be a little bit cheaper or around the same cost. So it just comes down to do you have the space to do it. And this is also something where you can salvage cases, power supplies, all, basically everything, because it's not like you're going to be gaming with it. It's just going to sit there probably in a corner. And then you could grab something like uh, either Synergy, which they have, they run ads with us right now. You've seen the ads, most of you. Uh, you could run something like Synergy so that you can just use one keyboard and mouse to interact with the host system that does the gaming and the streaming system. Uh, or you could use that new Logitech keyboard and mouse that we saw at PAX, which has wireless and Bluetooth options. And you set it up for Bluetooth on one machine and wireless on the other, and you just toggle between them. That would be a software or a hardware solution to the problem. So then you can only have uh, one set of peripherals as well, which would be pretty nice. Next question is from Waffle, who says, uh, I want to ask a question that pertains to new motherboards like the Asus Crosshair Hero 6, which come with AIO headers, but don't know how to ask it. It might go something like this. Should we, buy, should we be using AIO headers or not? Are there any performance benefits? If not, what should we be doing? And should the consumers care if a motherboard has an AIO he header? What do you think? I don't know if I answered this one before, but uh, those headers on motherboards are primarily there for things like uh, the motors. So the liquid cooler motors are generally something like eight pole as opposed to four pole on most fans. So um, depending on how they're set up and what motherboard it is, I don't know what the crosshair does, but they might have changed uh, the math in there so that it reads the RPM accurately. If you plug something like uh, an eight pole engine 27 or an eight pole pump, into some of the headers on some of the motherboards like we saw when we tested the Engine 27. Uh, sometimes those headers will read it as a four pole motor. And if it does, what will happen is you'll get two times the RPM readout in BIOS as reality. So with Engine 27, it's been at 2500 RPM, but our BIOS was reporting 5000, which is enough to take off your hand. So uh, clearly there's uh, there's a reason there just in terms of making sure you have an accurate re uh, reading of reality. Um, other than that, it's, uh, there are some different options on some of the boards we've worked with where the AIO headers will have uh, different profiles for their uh, percent duty cycles for how their, uh, the pump behaves under different conditions as opposed to a fan. And I think that pretty much is it. There might be one or two things I'm, I'm not familiar with because I've only really used the AIO headers on the ASUS boards lately. So if you know of differences with the Gigabyte boards or MSI boards, let me know in the comments uh, because I haven't really looked into that beyond what I've just said. Next question is from Sir Papa who says, uh, ask GN thoughts on testing cases with water cooling alongside air cooling. My thought is that cases get bigger. Uh, as cases get bigger, the air from the front fans loses its speed and therefore cooling performance. Do you think that an AIO would be an equalizer between big and small cases, therefore having purpose in testing, or would the workload become too high? The workload does become pretty high. A uh, couple of things to this question. It's a good one. So we did publish the H500P radiator placement guide after the review, which basically does this. Uh, it also tests the radiator in different mounting locations to see which one's best. But first of all, with regard to workload becoming too high, that H500P radiator placement video, I'm almost definitely not going to make ROI on. So you can see why we won't want to do that for every case review because we'd lose money on all of them. Um, the next thing is uh, in terms of thermal testing and cooling testing, you run into challenges where some cases will support radiator mounts in different positions than others. So it becomes a question of how do we standardize this? Do we want to always use it in the top position because there's pretty much always going to be one? Or do we put it in the front position? And then you have a lot more uh, variables to deal with explaining to the viewers or readers when you're talking about performance. Because ideally, you're not doing what we did for the H500P and testing a radiator in every slot because it's just not, I mean, it's just not sustainable as a business model. 
but uh, if you test only one position, there's a chance of either the CPU is slightly worse than it could be, or the GPU is slightly worse than it could be, because based on where the cooler is, one of those components will cool better than the other normally. So that's a consideration. Uh, another big consideration is that the closed loop coolers are sort of big equalizers in that as you start using them to cool the CPU, you lose some of the resolution on the differences between a really bad and a mid-range case. So it starts, you start making something like uh, Antec P8 look somewhat acceptable just simply because you're using liquid to cool it and brute force. Um, so you do lose some test resolution on the differences between high-end, or not even high-end, but mid-range and low-end, which is what we care about the most. Uh, and then, uh, other than that, I, I mean, yeah, it's basically, it comes down to how do you standardize placement? Um, if a case doesn't support radiator mounting in one spot where the previous case did, how do you reconcile that in your testing and your review and your notes? Because the performance is now going to be contingent more on the radiator location than on the case design itself. Uh, and then you have concerns of obviously workload becoming too great to make money off of the content because you can't sustain an operation that requires money to, to continue if you are spending more than you make. Um, and finally is just the, uh, the fact that the CLCs do sometimes perform too well in, to the point where you can't see as big of a problem with the truly bad cases as you would otherwise. And a lot of the times the truly bad cases are ones that would be paired with an air cooler anyway. So we wouldn't want to do just liquid coolers because you lose that resolution, but doing both has its own challenges. Uh, great question though. Um, basically our solution to this is to try and do stuff like the H500P radiator placement guide on a per case basis with cases that people have clearly expressed a lot of interest in. So not all of them, but just stuff that we think we could actually get the traffic on, like the H500P or something similar to that. Next question is from uh, Jonas or Jonas Bjorklund, who says, follow-up question to the radiator positioning question. You said that it is suboptimal to have the tubes going up and not down with the CLC. I've heard this before, but I really don't get why this is the case, probably because of a lack of understanding of how the inlet and outlet to a radiator looks. I watched your video on AIO coolers, but as I remember, that particular detail wasn't covered. Um, so we've ans I've answered this one a few times over the last few years, but the very short of it is, uh, well, there's a few things, but one of them, if you haven't seen our TLDR, how liquid coolers work, watch that. But as for liquid coolers and orientation, basically this comes back to me saying, mount with the tubes oriented down, not up. So if you're mounting the front of the case, you want the tubes down here, even if it's going to look a little funny, as opposed to up high. And that's just gravity. It's because the air in the tank will float to the top. And if the tubes are at the top, they're going to be where those air pockets can form. And so what happens then is you can get some gurgling in the pump every now and then when air is sucked through the tubes, because it's sitting at the top of the tank and the radiator. So as it gets sucked through the tubes, it gets pulled through the pump, and you get some bubbling noises that people don't tend to like. Theoretically, there could be some impact to longevity there as well, uh, but I don't have, I, I, I mean, we haven't done any longevity tests like that, but theoretically there could be. Um, the main concern though is just noise, and then after that, longevity is a potential concern. That's the main reason you do it that way though. Uh, a big absolute no-no with radiators is don't ever take something like a hybrid card and mount it with the radiator in the bottom of the case with the tubes up, because then you're fighting gravity to a point where as permeation occurs naturally over time and you have less liquid in the loop, you're gonna have bigger air pockets. Those will sit between the, uh, the barbs, the flanges, and the tank and the radiator, and that'll cause issues with pulling air through the loop and causing damage. In fact, it's bad enough that EVGA's hybrid installation guides that come in the manual say not to install it that way. Next question, Alex Komen says, Steve, I've been watching the Threadripper review since I want to get it for work, 3D rendering. My question is, why do you keep calling it Blender rendering? I know you guys use Blender to test performance, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. 
There are so many render engines out there, it might confuse newcomers to the industry that it's only good for Blender. Wouldn't it be better when referring to 3D rendering performance or video encoding performance to call it like that instead of Blender rendering or Premiere rendering? Uh, you don't call streaming performance OBS or XSplit performance. Uh, so as I addressed, and this was from Discord, in Discord, uh, streaming performance, we don't call OBS or XSplit because they're irrelevant to the equation. It's just, it's, they're just wrapping H.264 encoding, and then you apply some settings to it. So all you need to know is those settings. Um, it kind of matters. Like, we do actually say we use OBS for this, but I don't say OBS encoding. I say H.264 encoding. As for the actual question, we call it Blender rendering or Premiere rendering because we don't test the other applications. So I can't, in good faith, just say rendering and think that it will apply equally to all applications because it doesn't. Premiere is a great example. Premiere, if you've ever worked with it uh, on a scale like we do or greater, you know how much fun it can be to work with and how reliable it is. And Premiere has very specific and peculiar behaviors with rendering. So for us to say a CPU uh, renders videos X percent better than another CPU would be disingenuous if our only data point is Adobe Premiere because Adobe Premiere has its own unique and complex behaviors that even we don't fully understand. So, uh, and most other people for that matter. So you can't really just say, you can't take Adobe Premiere data for rendering videos and say CPU A renders videos 5% faster than CPU B. So, so if you're using Sony Vegas or DaVinci Resolve, I had to look up the second one, uh, or something like that, they're going to have way different performance than what we do with Premiere. And also it varies based on video file and codec and things like that. So AVC HD 1080p 60 on one with certain parameters for rendering in terms of bit rate, uh, warps and uh, color correction, scales, things like that, it will render differently and perform differently in Premiere than software B. So it is not accurate to, to just call it video rendering. As for Blender rendering, we use Cycles, the Cycles renderer in Blender, and we use specific settings uh, defined in Blender on the per project basis for what's, how it's being rendered, what, how many samples, what size, things like that. And same thing there, we're not testing 3ds Max, we're not testing Maya, so I don't know how they perform. They could very well perform differently. If they're not using the same renderer, then performance could be different. And we're not going to say 3D rendering if all we're testing is Blender. So uh, that's, that's why I say Blender rendering and Premiere rendering, because I tested Blender and Premiere. Uh, and there are a lot of differences potentially between software that we can't account for without testing it as well. So that should pretty much answer that one. Last question for this week. Actually, it's not really a question. Uh, Cookie King Gaming says on our Noctua liquid versus air coolers video that we just posted, Gamers Nexus, stop using charts. These results are not tested or proven. So basically this is fake content if you call stupid charts content. Disliked. Okay, uh, anyway, thanks for watching. You can leave your comments below for the next episode. Hopefully there are questions. I don't want to encourage things like the last comment, mostly because I'm going to have an aneurysm if I try to understand what it means. Uh, you can subscribe for more, as always, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly or join the Patreon community Discord where some of these questions came from. I'll see you all next time. <laughs>